Now I showed you Valentino as the sheik. You should know that um, Madame Elena Di Scavini, known as Lenchi, had a fascination with celebrities and she really tried to capitalize on this. This is in the 19, early 1920s. The whole idea of making um, celebrity dolls was just coming along and the whole concept of licensing was sort of unknown at the beginning and then began to be developed, but it's not really clear which of her dolls were ever licensed or if they just were made to represent certain people. Certainly, um, we know that, well, that little boxer guy is a very good example. She made for one year virtually a duplicate, well, a duplicate costume of this doll, an, an earlier doll that she called, um, that that she called Gene Tunney. He was the very, very famous um, world um, heavyweight title holder of doll, of um, wrestling. And she made a doll that she actually used with that name, but she did it for one year only. So what happened? Why did she not continue making it? Because obviously people liked the doll because she made another doll wearing the exact same costume and she simply called it Boxer. We know that in the time that the first one came out was about the beginning of the 1920s. And during that time, Jean Tunney was in Paris and he had stayed on after World War I and tr was trying to work as part of a fundraising for um, people who needed help. At that time, he was a part of a charity group. So I don't know. We don't know any of these stories and we need to know them. And we just wish there would be so much more research. There's so much open, there's so many clues, and everybody needs to dive in and try to get to the bottom of these stories because the stories about the dolls, that's their real life. It's all about the stories, and that's so important. Well, standing right next to him is a cowboy, and that's another example. She made a doll, and she made it for one year, and that doll was called Tom Mix. Now, clearly, she had had an interest in the American West because in her very first dolls that we showed you on the very beginning of this video, she had the cowboy and the Indian chief. So this was, this was went on in Europe at this time. Uh, particularly French and Italians had a fascination with um, the American West. In fact, it continued in Italy because when you think back into the 60s and 70s, what did they call them? The spaghetti westerns? So uh, that kind of fascination was going on at the time. Um, so she made Right after her first dolls that were called Cowboy and Indian, she made another doll that she actually called Tom Mix. She only made that for a very short period of time, but shortly thereafter, this doll appeared. He was simply named Cowboy, or had a name, a number, a serial number, but he was not named Tom Mix. Now, why did that happen? Was she stopped from doing it, or did she not want to pay royalties? We don't know the answer to those questions and we really wish we did. While I'm standing here, I want to stand because I want to show you something about this particular model. This is from her, her 300 series that became one of her most popular series of all times. But when you're looking at Lenchies, one of the things you need to look at in the details is check it out. He has his pipe. And what does his pipe say on the stem? Lenchie. So every little detail counted to this woman in the making and production of her dolls. I love his smoking pajamas. I think they're pretty fancy. Behind him, I don't know, can you see the little, um, the little boy that's also smoking with a little checkered? Well, everybody knows who he is. He's Jackie Coogan, and you recognize him from early silent films. And so that was a, you know, a very, very specific doll that she made and retained making that over a period of time. From the miniature series, The Bride and Groom, very, very rare to find and particularly rare to find, still never having gotten divorced, but still intact. And there they are, a luxury costume. This is one of the wonderful costumes made with that really tousled ringlet curled hair. Her wigs were so important because she made different type of wigs over a period of time. And eventually they just ended up being kind of a cap, but originally they were all, um, they were weft stitched, to, weft stitched to her head in rows and it made wigs that were so absolutely extraordinary. And I've stayed up here because I wanna show you the next girl 
and you're seeing her from the side view because I want you to see that bonnet. That is so incredible. But I'm going to turn her around now so you can see her in front of her face because she has the most beautiful complexion. And check out her sandals as well because those sandals with those big red bows, what an imagination to have come up with that costume. It's, it's just absolutely delightful. It's so vivid and brilliant. And while I'm still standing here, I want to show you again, illustrating her, her fascination with themes that she would begin in one era, and then maybe 15 years later, the firm was still doing it. And here was her wonderful doll, Pan, which is very, very seldom ever shows up. And this was one of her novelty pieces. Here is his little mouth pipes that he has. He has the the little legs with the hoof feet, wonderful expression, okay? And then look what we have here. This was done in the late 40s and 50s, and it's Pan again, still with the harmonica. And I'm gonna turn him around so you can see him from the back. He is just absolutely dandy. And we're able to date him from the cloth label that he still has on him, which dates from that particular time period but wonderful, wonderful um, felt work, overlay felt work over and over again with little flower detail. It's just absolutely fascinating. And a theme that um, she considered, so she or the firm considered so popular that they continue to have it. Up on that top shelf, we talked about her fascination with the Asian theme. And again, someone needs to do more research and find out why this, she did these glorious, big, dramatic pieces um, of Asian children or Asian characters. And it was, they clearly were intended as exhibition pieces and it's, there's got to be more behind it from what we know. But up on top, on the very top level, next to our red-haired Russian, is, a, is um, a very, very wonderful piece sitting on a cushion that comes with him. He's probably one of the few known to exist of this doll. And once again, look at his turban and compare it in your mind with a turban that I showed you before, which had curled edges. And this one is very tight to his face. He has all of these wonderful um, wooden accessories, the wooden hand-painted jewelry. See the little elephant on his chest? And he has the earrings and he has all of these other great details. In front of him with the red hair is her takeoff on one of the legendary uh, Japanese characters. And she kind of skewed his name a little bit to call him Fukuroku, um, and he was the god of longevity. And this is one of the rarest of the Lenchi pieces to find, extraordinary in its detail of the layering of the costume and the characterization, very, very important piece to her. Um, this, he appeared in the 1924 catalog, and having these catalogs is so valuable because it able, enables us to really pinpoint the year that different models came out. Next to him, with the pipe in her mouth, is Husan. She actually named the doll Husan, and again, we designed it so that she would be posed kneeling in that very realistic kind of manner, as though she were smoking the pipe, and very, very fine detail of the embroidery of her costume once again. Standing tall is Sam. That's what she named him, was Sam. And uh, um, I, keep, I keep using the phrase that these pieces are rare, but really, um, Elaine Romberg managed to acquire some of the rarest pieces of, from the whole Lenchy lit litany, and this is one of, the, one of the best ones of all. He has all of these great pieces of embroidery from his arm wristlets to his turban, to his pants, to his shoes even. And then he has the wooden accessories um, sword as well, a very, very grand piece. Now, who is that up on top? Who could not possibly know that that is Josephine Baker in her wonderful costume from her famous banana dance? Um, Madame de Scavini knew um, Josephine Baker. They became friends, and she asked to make a doll of her, and it became one of her popular dolls, although very, very few examples of it show up today. And she even made it with the felt bananas forming the skirt, which was part of Josephine Baker's costume. And if you don't know Josephine Baker, you should read about her because she was a 
pretty significant American woman, an American black woman, who was forced to go to Paris to really allow her dancing skills to become so predominant that became world famous. Very, very wonderful. Now, scoot down to the bottom, and I want you see our man in the Spanish Toreador costume. All right, well, he was actually, she named him in her catalog. She named him Bombita. Now, there was actually Bombita. There were two brothers. They were Emilio and Ricardo Torres, who were famous matadors of the time. Very, very famous. And they went under they, their promotional name, their trade name or stage name was Bombita. So that's clearly who this was intended to be. And I'm going to show you a little bit of detail about the costume of Bombita. She designed it, so this was designed to be thrown off the shoulder, just as it would be. Beautiful soutache embroidery over the back of it. Look at his hair. It's like this fleecy hair, and look, I'm gonna tip it down so you can see the way the hat is made with the pom-poms on the side. If you turn him around to the front, then you are going to see the tucks in the shirt, you're going to see the soutache embroidery, gilt embroidery on the front of the vest and the pants. And even the leather shoes are original with their red edging, their red felt edging. This is a really great piece with wonderful design possibilities. Now, when you're collecting lenchies, there's so many ways you could collect them. Like I haven't even started to, to touch with you on the facial models. And that's another whole study in itself. Or the time periods they were made or the... Um, or the type, the way the wigs could be attached, or the different stylized method they have. This is a great doll. I know it's kind of very stereotypical, but it's great because it has a great story for it. Marlena Dietrich had one of these dolls, and it's, she was a very, very, she was a good friend of um, Alina Discavini, and she really promoted her dolls all over. And she carried one of these, and she always carried it with her wherever she traveled, and there are photographs. In the catalog, we put in a photograph of her holding this doll. Very, very wonderful, a wonderful doll. And again, the little painted um, jewelry. Here, this one came around the back. Different colored beads, and then the serpent in the front, the painted wooden. These are carved wooden lions, and it's just absolutely wonderful. And an early button on the back, and many of Elaine Romberg's pieces will have the early buttons, which help to date them. Uh, this is from early 1920 period. By the time we come to the end of the 1920s, the Lynchy firm was, was in full swing, and yet, ironically, it didn't last that long to, because of world events, um, namely the World Depression that came along and made it harder and harder to really have success in selling. So during the next 10 years, during the 1930s, the Lynchy firm went through a series of convolutions, but still managed to produce some pretty remarkable dolls, of which Elaine Romberg has been able to acquire some that she's offering to you in this great landmark collection. So let's start with our girl um, standing up tall in the black costume known as the Merry Widow. And that's, of course, what she is. Now, if you look at her eyes, for the first time, we have moved away from the painted eyes of the earlier period, and we now have the glass eyes, which she's had commissioned, which were glass, flirty, googly eyes. Um, an important milestone. And we have three examples from this series. You can see the widow. You can see down below her the girl with the embroidered apron. And then you see the Scottish girl um, holding the little dog. And they all, again, continue to have wonderful details of felt applique, finest fabrics, but a different type of um, facial expression, um, capitalizing on that innocent look. During the time period of the late 20s into the 30s, the 300 model became really the kind of go-to model that people loved and collectors honestly still love today. And so we have him standing up tallest on that table our mountain hiker with the skis. He has just an extraordinary costume, and it's absolutely complete, including the ski poles, the skis, um, his costume, everything about him is wonderful. Standing next to him 
a very, very rare set. And this is the Native American um, boy and girl uh, with his feathered headdress. And she has, at the back of her costume, she's carrying the little baby in um, the bunting. So a very, very wonderful set there. Coming around, oh, there's so many wonderful ones on here and they're all different. Let me see what I want to talk to you about. By the time the 1930s arrived, um, Madame de Scavini, known as Lenchi, um, realized that the major profit or the major market for her pieces was going to be in dolls of fashion, child dolls in very stylish clothes of the 1930s. And she tried different mediums. She tried uh, different fabric costumes. She went into organdy a lot because that was an easier uh, fabric for her to obtain. And then she still retained working with her wonderful felt dolls and she would have dolls in various kind of sport, sport activities, um, fashion, uh, fashionable going to the market kind of costumes, and even tried different things. Two dolls in particular I want to point out to you on this table that are quite rare. There's the girl that is right in the middle with the blonde hair. She does have a different kind of face you can see. This doll was named Kiki. She was one of the prosperity babies. It was during the 1930s when Lenchi was trying to come up with different techniques um, for creating her dolls. And at first glance, a doll does not even look like cloth. It doesn't look like the felt dolls. It actually is a cloth doll, however. Very, very rare. Only a few models were ever made. And to her left, there is another girl in a yellow dress with brunette hair. Um, and she has, if you look at her face, she's smiling and she has a smiling expression with painted teeth. And again, that a very, very rare model to find. But scanning around over that whole table, you can see the dolls are very stylish. They're, um, the costumes are bright. They're the type of costumes that children would be wearing if they were um, fashionable children at the time. And you also see another little thing appearing, like right in the front, you see that little brown dog that reminds me of Pluto. I'm not sure if that's who he is. But then she started to create a series of novelty pieces. There was Pluto. There was the grasshopper that he's looking at and other various pieces like that. She did ladies' handbags, did various novelty pieces, all of which um, worked but didn't really keep the company afloat. And by the um, end of the 1930s, the Lenchy company, as we knew it, had really kind of um, ended. She had left the firm. Uh, the company was now owned by others and continued on for some time. But what we are showing here from the Elaine Romberg collection is from the golden age of the Lenchy period, from the early 1920 through the end of the 1930s. An extraordinary collection of dolls representing history, representing celebrity, representing momentous events of the time, representing high fashion, and a whole uh, panoply across the board of different styles of production and different experimental ways that she worked to produce. This is a wonderful collection, and I hope that many of you will be able to come and view it in person. This is about half of the pieces. Um, there are many, many more, and thank you all for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it.